Welcome to Eregina 120, video 6. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Cliff, and uh, this is a short video series. Uh, of, I guess little things that I've picked up during my the course of my degree. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about optimization problems. Now these you might have encountered in high school. Uh, to be honest, uh, I do seem to remember that they were kind of slipped under the, the you know, in the textbook here and there, um, but they really didn't have the significance that uh, they would have had uh, when that I encountered them later on. And I certainly didn't really clue into the implications of the idea of an optimization problem itself. Um, so these are going to be uh, things where you determine the optimal or the best, you know, number of of of, of one property or one value uh, to to in a situation where you're rewarded or, or where there's a cost associated with um, or, or where you're butting up against uh, a constraint of some kind. Uh, all of these are kind of in the same family of problems. Uh, you're going to need, uh, or they especially become valuable once we start talking about derivatives and integrals uh, and calculus, but since I haven't talked about that yet, uh, I'm going to try to hopefully describe it in a way that you don't really need that yet, uh, but just keep that in mind. And so, again, I, it, it, it is something that has, uh, it, it, in, all or in all probability, uh, been introduced earlier, uh, but I was kind of of two minds to uh, problems in general. So, for example, I would have had uh, a chess set put in front of me that was run by a computer, and I mean, I know that chess wasn't a solved problem. Uh, uh, especially back then, and uh, but nevertheless, it, it's kind of scared me how powerful this engine was, uh, because I wasn't treating chess as a problem that could be solved, or wasn't treating chess as a problem that uh, you could solve in an optimal way, so that you would know exactly the the perfect moves to make. Uh, same thing with a lot of other problems. You have problems in your life, personal problems, uh, problems where involving. Uh, thinking about problems, so the, the problem of reasoning and the problems of how to reason properly, all of these things, you know, when you approach it from one direction, it, it, it seems almost mystical, impossible to wrap your head around, but the idea that you could frame the problem in a way where there may be an answer to it that's possible, that where there are no other answers that are better, that in it in and of itself is a valuable thing to start looking for. Uh, if you can express the, the, the constraints around it, you can start to express properties of the, the problem, properties of the situation, properties of the system. You might be able to start looking for ways of gaining those properties or running up right to the edge of them without having to do uh, a lot of the other, I, I guess, development to get to them. Uh, if you see my other video series, the 10 Ideas 50 Years, you'll notice that there's a human judgment and optimality book uh, that tries to take the idea of optimi opti optimization and optimality and kind of apply it to human reasoning itself. Uh, this is an example of that. Um, there's, it, it's just so powerful to know that there's no better way of solving a problem until you start questioning the premises that the problem is based on, until you start questioning the problem itself. Uh, that is the, the, the part where you can do better, uh, but again, it forces you to address the problem itself rather than kind of being stuck at, in, in this sort of, I don't know what to do next uh, mindset. Uh, you can, of course, usually find a better problem or, or change the problem, uh, but you can't always, so it's, it's worth keeping that in mind. So just as a kind of really basic example, uh, we just had a lab today here in home base uh, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, where some children were playing with lemons and managed to get some voltage out of the lemons. So we were able to get 0 0.8 volts. per lemon. And the LEDs took about, let's say, three volts. How many lemons does it take to light one LED? So we 
have our kind of equation set up here. Hopefully my head's not in the way as it kind of was last time. Um, and plunging this into our handy dandy calculator. We get 3.75. So it's, it's kind of a contrived and silly example, uh, but if you have 3.75 lemons, you have enough to light a 3-volt LED. Uh, or if it's a 3-volt to burn it out, you only need 3.75 or 3.75 to, to burn it out. Either way, uh, once you have this number, there is no better way to answer this question. Uh, you can answer other questions in a better way. You can answer more valuable questions. Once you know this, you know this, and nothing can take that away from you. No authority figure, no, uh, welcome back. Uh, I have some guests, but hopefully you get the idea, and thanks for watching.